Good afternoon. My name is John Lindahl, and I'd like to welcome you to the Nebraska State Historical Society's Brown Bag Lecture Series held here at the Museum of Nebraska History on the third Thursday of every month. Now, a detailed schedule for this series, as well as information about all the Historical Society's programs and services, can be found on our website at nebraskahistory.org. Before I introduce today's speaker, I want to thank the Nebraska State Historical Society Foundation for funding the filming of these lectures. Their financial support allows us to tape and broadcast these programs on public access television. Our speaker today is Jonathan Gregory. Jonathan is a doctoral student in textile history at the University of Nebraska here in Lincoln. And he's also curatorial assistant for the Quilting Across the Globe project at the International Quilt Study Center and Museum also here in Lincoln. He's also a contributor and has assisted the editorial team on the center's cataloging project funded by the John P. Getty Foundation. Mr. Gregory's research focuses upon American quilt history, including quilt making with association to America, American wars and the social meanings and functions of quilts. He obtained a BS degree in human resources management from Friends University in Wichita, Kansas, and an MA in textile history uh, quilt studies from the University of Nebraska. The title of his topic today is Memory in Cloth. He will discuss his research paper, which examines American textiles and quilts, especially signature album quilts from 1800 to 1865. Now, please welcome Jonathan Gregory. Thank you. It's uh, my pleasure to be here today at the Museum of, Nat of Nebraska History. Um, at the IQSC and the History Museum have a great relationship, uh, cooperating on exhibitions. And it's really my honor to be here to be part of the museum's programming today. Um, and I was excited as I came in, there's this nice exhibition about memory in the, uh, in the lobby gallery. Um, and the, two quilts, one on each side of the doorway here, um, that show how individuals collected names or things and used them as material ways to remember things that were important to them. And that's a great introduction to um, what I would like to talk about today, which is a memory in cloth. Uh, American quilts and memory. <clears throat> I, I approach what I'll talk about today from um, uh, from a material culture viewpoint. Um, material culture is uh, an area of academic study, but it, just in basic terms, it, it's it's stating that material objects reflect things to us. They tell us things about religious, philosophical, social. Um, political, all sorts of things related to the culture uh, in the time and the place that the object, that material object, was created. Um, they also, material objects also have changing meanings in each of these areas as they are used and reinterpreted as time passes. So it's a very rich study uh, to study a material object. Um, it's not always easy because um, if you're going to an archive, which there's great archives here uh, in Nebraska, you can read exactly what was said about an event. Or, um, But in a material object, it's not always as straightforward. We don't always know who made it or why they made it. But we, we go to the object and begin to learn what we can by uh, doing an analysis of it. So um, I'm not going to give you a detailed analysis of quilts today from a material culture uh, framework, but that this is a sort of uh, ideology or uh, a methodology that informs some of what I do. In particular, it's, I think it's important uh, for what we're going to talk about today is that material objects, they store the information beyond an individual's experience. So a maker may make an object or something, but um, it it then becomes other than that person, and it, it has its own life. Um, and in some cases, objects are created specifically to carry this information, like the exhibit in the hallway. 
uh, memory items that were made particularly so that they could um, be referred to to remember something about the past. Um, material objects, therefore, according to Marius Quint, who's a social historian or a cultural historian in England, he says that material objects are analogs of our living memory. And I think that's, that's very interesting. Um, and then, therefore, material objects can be read as texts or as documents um, that we look to as historians when we're doing our research. So that's a bit about material culture. Uh, my topic today deals with memory. And to give a little bit of background from where, uh, uh, how I approach this, um, memory, I would state first, is, is a constructed thing. We, um, as individuals, we have a limitation. We, we just can't remember everything that occurs in our life. I could ask most of you here today what you had for <laughs> breakfast, and you may have to think about it, and you may never come up with the answer. So we do not try to remember everything, and then we can't remember everything. So there is a human limitation to memory. But there are certain things we do remember, and we move them, we embed them into our long-term memory. Um, and often we have to, to do that, we rehearse them, which is, we, we, we remember them. We think about what happened again. Maybe right now you're going to embed breakfast in your long-term memory because I've called you to rehearse it. Um, but that's how we form our memories. That's the process that happens internally. Um, sometimes we, we're reconstructing things too um, as they seem they should have been. Um, I once saw an automobile accident in my rearview mirror, in my side rearview mirror. And I, as I would tell the story, I realized that some of it was I didn't really see what I was saying. I was constructing extra parts of it that would make sense. It was like, well, why did such and such, why did the silver Jeep hit the red sedan? Well, it's because they were pulling out from a blind spot in a parking lot. Well, why did they pull out in heavy traffic? Well, somebody had probably signaled them or left an opening. So, but I didn't see all of that in my mirror. But it does make sense that that's probably what's happened because we have seen similar things. So we pull together memories in a construction. And those things also reflect the things that we value, the things we want to remember, the, thing, the way we see the world. Um, memory is also something that is mediated. And uh, we've already talked about objects as being uh, something that memory is recorded into. So we, we use objects to store that memory and to transfer it maybe to the next generation or maybe to ourselves in the future because we want to remember something. Um, so, it's, I think it's quite interesting that we as humans want to do this. But what I'd like to do is to give sort of an example, and I may ask you to participate here uh, to help me out, but I'm going to look at a national level, at how we remember things as a nation. And we're going to use a couple of monuments in Washington, D.C. Um, I visited in D.C. and took these photos uh, a couple of summers ago. This is the World War II Veterans um, Memorial in, on the Washington Mall. Um, just one section of it, but uh, many of you may have seen this already. Uh, and there's this inscription here that uh, I'll read for you. It says, today the guns are silent. A great tragedy has ended. A great victory has been won. The skies no longer rain death. The seas bear only commerce. Men everywhere walk upright in the sunlight. The entire world is quietly at peace. There, are, If you were to walk around the monument, you would see um, a wall of gold stars. You would see uh, soothing fountains. You would see um, solid gray granite pillars encircling this monument, quotes from presidents and generals, um, bronze reliefs of military and civilian people doing things that support the war effort. So this is, this is how 
um, our nation, our government, is remembering this war. There's also, uh, just a few yards away, the wa Vietnam War Memorial. Um, it is black granite. It's smooth. There's only names, and these names do not show the ranks. Um, it's a monument that emerges out of the soil and reaches up a height in the very middle um, that is taller, it dwarfs the person. Um, there are no flags, there's no presidential quotes. Okay, another memory. So this is where I could use your help. Um, maybe you could tell me what is remembered and what is forgotten in these monuments. And don't be shy. Right, and the, um, she said that the one on the right is not declaring anything one, correct? I think the one on the right helps us to remember that these were all people, individuals, no ranks. The Vietnam Memorial helps yeah. us remember their individuals, their peoples, by removing their rank from the memorial. Yes. Yes. Basically, both of them are remembering in different ways wars, these events happened. Yes. One in a more heroic sense and one, this is what it costs. Yes, she said that um, both of them are helping us remember that the wars occurred but in different ways. One in a heroic sense and the other not. Thank you. So, um, let me give you another example. This is a textile example, and I, I, this is about quilts, but I'm throwing in some, a few other textiles here just because I like them. This is a memorial or a commemorative textile. It's called The Apotheosis of Benjamin Franklin and George Washington. It's from about 1785. Um, believe it or not, it was printed in England, uh, as we believe. Um, I th think that's one of the most interesting things about it. Um, you may be able to see these things, but it has all these interesting symbols, uh, Lady Liberty in the chariot, there is a, a circular Greek style building like a temple, it says the Temple of Fame. There uh, is a Native American holding a striped banner that reminds us of our American flag and is uh, trumpeting along with the procession. There's references to the Stamp Act, uh, there's the Don't Tread on Me flag, there's military references by uniforms, shields, a mounted regiment, and um, as I mentioned, the Greek temple form, which is a, a reference to the Greek Republic um, upon which the early American Republic was modeled. And of course, the title of the textile, the Apotheosis, is, is this that Franklin and, and Washington are ascending into a sort of a deified state here. So, this is a memory that was recorded uh, over 200 years ago. And it was reflecting what the culture at that time wanted to remember about these men and their role in this nation. Now we might look at it today and have a, a little different response. We may not feel quite as, um, as if these men are gods. Oh, we may. Uh, but that's the interesting thing. We all may come to these objects and take different things away from them. Uh, but nevertheless, this is recording a version of the memory. It is not stating anything about uh, either man's flaws or um, anything else about the context in which they might have uh, done what they did in our nation. So we're seeing that there's certain things that are remembered, there's certain things that are omitted. That's how memory works. Uh, moving closer to quilts, we will eventually get there. <laughs> but, but I can't do it too quickly or you might uh, walk out too soon. So um, I want to, uh, as further background, there were things going on in the early 19th century that influenced Americans 
focus upon memory. And one of them was the Industrial Revolution. Um, this is a very general statement, but um, before industrialization, women's contribution to uh, the economy was through the home. The, they were essential in the economy, in food production and clothing production. Um, that was that began to change though with the Industrial Revolution when uh, the economy changed from exchange to wage labor where labor was taken out of the home and moved into shops and then into factories, moved from rural to urban centers. And so these caused great changes in women's uh, roles within the family and the society. One of the things that developed uh, in the 19th century was something that's called the separate spheres, uh, sometimes called the, the cult of true womanhood. Uh, you might read a number of names for this, but basically because of these industrial and social changes, women's roles began to be defined as directed towards the home and not towards the public sphere, but only in the private sphere. And in order to build this great nation that they that at this time uh, was off and running, there was a focus that women should be the primary moral guide um, uh, guides of the children. So they spent, they were to devote their time to the rearing of children, to the moral education. Um, women were to do the emotion work, to, to remember those who'd gone before and to um, uh, use their examples in training their children. So uh, women were to celebrate things, the, the celebrations of birthdays and the big Sunday lunches and things were, were things that emerged during this uh, time period. <clears throat> so there was an emphasis, and the point is, upon remembering things, remembering family, remembering things that were important to them as individuals and as a nation. The other thing that was going on is we, we had the Louisiana Purchase and we were opening up the West and families were starting to migrate. Uh, families that may have lived in a, in a region together for generations, suddenly one branch of the family moved to Ohio or to Kentucky or uh, somewhere West. And so these families were being stretched and uh, travel was not nearly as easy, of course, as it is today. And so the uh, prospect of coming home for Christmas was not on their calendar. But so there was an importance of trying to remember the family and to maintain those bonds. And this job fell to women because it was in their sphere. And the relationships between women <clears throat> in the 19th century um, were influential on memory. Women found security in a family-based female world. It was characterized by strong ties, mutual needs, and deep affections. <clears throat> and women it, it broadened the definition of, of family uh, to include those who weren't necessarily blood relatives, but the bonds with other women were as strong as sisters. And when these bonds, both blood and kinship and affectionate bonds, were um, stressed or severed by the changes in society, then often there was a response to try to with maintain those relationships and to remember them. We're finally to quilts. Um, one of the ways that this was done was through something that we call album and friendship quilts. Uh, some things enabled this to, to occur during the first part of the 19th century. There were technological changes. I mentioned the Industrial Revolution in the 1830s and 40s. Uh, the American textile uh, uh, industry was developing and with its growth there was a greater supply of goods and so the prices went down. And there was also an emerging middle class because of the changes in the economy. So there was more cash available to purchase goods. So 
the supply and now the ability to buy was there. So quilt making um, was growing at this time. Uh, there was also um, technologies would allow people to mark on their quilts. There were uh, efforts to make inks that would be indelible and that wouldn't attack the fabrics and there was various success there. Also, um, the other thing was, as we've talked about before, there's the, the emphasis on commemorating life events and quilts often were, were used to show, um, to, to mark these events, births and marriages and, uh, and also for recognition. So this is a, a picture of a, an autograph album. During the first part of the 19th century, it was not uncommon for people to hand around autograph albums, uh, among women particularly, and to sign each other's albums and write very sentimental verses and poems in them, uh, including uh, verses of scripture, lyrics of songs, poetry. Uh, it was very common. Well, this is believed to have influenced also the production of quilts that are called album quilts. Here's a, um, a detail of a block in a quilt in the International Quilt Study Center's collection, which actually has a album on it. It's, you were not able to see, um, but in the middle, it is inked album. So here is a direct reference to this in a quilt. This is also from a, a quilt in the International Quilt Study Center collection, an album quilt. Um, this is um, a quilt made by M.A. Knowles for her sister, her sweet sister Emma. This was made in 1843, also at that time when albums were popular. Um, the, on the left is a block that's showing just one of the inscriptions there. This one happens to be an inscription from uh, the Book of Romans in the New Testament. So the practice of inscribing on paper is also being done on cloth as a way to remember the person. Here's another quilt, um, also from the 1840s. This is a quilt that was made in Shippensburg, uh, Pennsylvania, most likely, dated 1843 and 1844. <clears throat> um, it's one of two quilts that are in the, the Quilt Study Center's collection. And they actually are going on exhibition starting Saturday uh, in an exhibition of chintz quilts. Um, one thing common to these two quilts is the Sturgeon family. So there's a connection between these quilts by having some of the same names on them. The other quilt comes from Ohio, though. An interesting block on this quilt has the inscription that commemorates or remembers the birth of William Rogers Sturgeon. He was born on September 26 of 1843. The other quilt, um, as I said, made in Springfield, Ohio, made about uh, eight years later. It also has the Sturgeon family names, and one of the blocks mentions the children of Richard and Helen Sturgeon of Philadelphia. Um, this is, and it has William, the same William whose birth was commemorated on the other quilt, also Bertie and Helen. Um, but what's interesting is William's name is not found in the 1850 census. And it, it's possible that this quilt has his name there as a memorial. It's possible that he did not live. And so rather than this quilt only commemorating and remembering the relationships of the living, it remembers possibly the relationships with those who have already gone before. Again emphasizing that great importance of remembering those who are significant. Another connection in these quilts is there is uh, the same uh, fabric in, to, in the quilts. Uh, this panel, a commemorative panel, panel of Queen Victoria of England. Uh, I don't know why Queen Victoria was interesting to the makers of these quilts, uh, but it does show that there, we have to look at it from a material culture viewpoint and say, why is it there? What does that say about them, that they would want to remember the Queen of England 
in the American Republic? It's a question without an answer. Here's another album quilt that was made by the members of an, a sewing society in First Baptist Church, Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. Um, this also in the International Quilt Study Center collection. It's, this quilt was made in honor of Anne Rees uh, when she was 71 years old. She was the widow of a former pastor of the church and she was being recognized in this quilt for her service to the church possibly including founding one of the first Sunday schools in Pennsylvania. Uh, this quilt is signed or inscribed by at least a hundred persons, including members of her family. <clears throat> Here's a couple of detail shots from this quilt. <clears throat> and what this quilt does is it serves as a reminder to Anne Reese of what her community thinks of her and how they remember her because they dedicate each block to her with various sentiments. Two that I think are quite interesting are ones that are from her own family, from her granddaughter, uh, the block in the center bottom. It says, I, Rosa Murray, wish to know, why patch a quilt for Grandma so? It must not be considered bold to wish her one made of pure gold. And her grandson's inscription seems to hint at the idea of the cult of true womanhood that I mentioned earlier. And he, on his block, has written, To my grandmother, thou hast watched o'er my childhood, thou guiding my youth, with sweet lessons of love from the volume of truths. Oh, may the rich fruit of my manhood repay the care thou hast lavished on life's every day. May the frail plant, once sheltered by thee from the storm, be the tree that shall shade and protect thee from harm. And when life shall be over, my sins all forgiven, may I meet and be with thee forever in heaven. I could imagine Anne Reese holding this quilt and reading each of these things and thinking of each person and what they meant to her and what um, she meant to them and finding it a very meaningful quilt. I'm going to jump forward into the later part of the, of the 19th century because quilts and memory didn't stop at 1850 or 1860. This is a crazy quilt from the collection of the International Quilt Study Center. Uh, it has a, a number of interesting ribbons. Uh, at this time in, uh, in the late, uh, 20th, uh, eight, late 19th and early 20th century, there, it was frequent that there would be silk ribbons or printed cloth given out at different functions. And so this seems to be the scrapbook of one family, most possibly. They're, they're from Springfield, Ohio. There is a commemorative ribbon from an 1885 wedding joining two families. There are ribbons relating to the Union Army, uh, the Grand Army of the Republic, women's auxiliaries to that. There's something about a wheelman's convention indicating that the, someone in the family was a bicycle rider. Very, very interesting portrait of a family's involvements and associations and amusements. And something that we can look at, and I'm sure those who, who owned it looked at it and remembered um, their family, the members of their family, what was important and what defined them. One other type of um, quilt I want to focus on, uh, besides the album quilts, is uh, patriotic and war quilts. The Americans tend to be a patriotic people, and maybe more so than other nations and cultures. Um, and these quilts um, seem to be a means of recording, and again, we would think of this probably as women's art, uh, women recording their political opinions and their ideas. Um, and we have to remember that um, before 1920, women did not have a political voice in our nation, in, in nationally at least, and in most cases locally as well. So this um, 
is an example of women's speech and then women documenting for future generations to remember how they felt about um, the, um, the political issues of their time. Also, war quilts often are connected with political viewpoints, but there's uh, families remember those who, from their own family, contributed to a war effort and may have died. This is a quilt uh, jumping back now into the first part of the um, 19th century. This is from 1847. This is from a quilt made in Baltimore, and it has a monument that says Ringgold. There's two monuments on this, two blocks with monuments to Ringgold in this quilt, and another one to Watson. Um, Major Ringgold w died while serving in the Mexican-American War in uh, 1846, I believe, as did Watson, who was killed in the Battle of Monterey. And th these men were from Baltimore, and so these were um, men of whom the community was proud, obviously, and they were they are being commemorated here, along with symbols of America, with the stripes on the flag. Um, uh, the guns leaned up against the fence on either side of the monument. And interestingly, um, on either side of the monument are cactus, which was a, a plant form that was introduced uh, into the uh, Baltimore region uh, by those who were returning from the war. This is a quilt uh, from the Civil War era made by Amanda Sparing of Philadelphia. It was made in 1872. Um, what is extremely interesting here is the quilt has many inscriptions uh, in the white area of each block. Um, and they record events from Lincoln's election th through the end of 1861 um, in the war. And she was very clear on the quilt itself that her intention was that she was doing memory work. And this is what she wrote in the middle block. The idea of making it, meaning the quilt, arose from a desire of having a remembrancer of the times during which raised the rebellion of leading Southern men against the government of the United States. Its colors are of the Union, red, white, and blue, with the flag of our country and other national emblems displayed. The quilt is intended as a memento of the present times of civil strife, and as such it has been made a brief record of the leading events of the war, and it is hoped that it will be treasured as a family keepsake and a remembrancer of those who made it, and as such handed down to the latest generation. Uh, we have, it's nice that she told us what she was doing, isn't it? <laughs> Um, the American Centennial in 1876 um, was a, a big event, and when America began to, to be more conscious of its own history, and the celebration in Philadelphia was attended by um, many from our nation and abroad. Uh, some of the things that were available there were commemorative textiles, and this is an example of a quilt in the Quilt Study Center's collection that incorporates a number of these commemorative textiles. Uh, the two largest pieces are uh, scenes of the, the fair itself. But this quilt is recording uh, this person's um, pride in, in their nation and is something that they could also remember their attendance at this exhibition. And now coming right up to today. Um, memorial quilts are something that are still being made even in our current time. Uh, I have three slides here that have examples of quilts that have been made and given to families who have lost a member of, uh, in the Iraq War. Um, this quilt here is made uh, by a group called Marine Comfort Quilts, and this was made in the memory uh, for, the, for the family of Lance Corporal Brian Escalante, USMC, who was killed in Iraq. Um, in the very center of the quilt, there is a memorial block, which there's a detail shown here. It says, in loving memory of Lance Corporal Brian A. Escalante, 3rd Battalion, 4th Marine Regiment, Regiment 1st Marine Division, a First Marine Expeditionary Force Operation Iraqi Freedom Marine Comfort Quilt Group. 
Um, this group has made um, over 4,000 quilts and sent them to family members all over. And what's interesting is that those who are doing the memory work here of remembering, commemorating the life and sacrifice um, don't know the family that receives the quilt. It's a grassroots organization that has volunteers all over the nation and they, they make blocks and send them into a clearinghouse where they're assembled and uh, into a quilt and then mailed out to the family. So, um, yet they feel that this individual's life was important enough to commemorate and the family's loss important enough to try to aid, give comfort. Um, and there's another project that is attempting to do the same thing and it's called Home of the Brave Quilt Project. They've chosen to make replicas of Civil War era quilts and the Civil War was a time when uh, women in both the, the North and the South made many quilts in an effort to support their troops. So replicas are being made and given uh, for the same purpose, to commemorate the lives of those who are lost. Uh, the Home of the Brave quilts have a, a, um, a label on the back, which you see a detail of here, that um, shows that it's a replica of the U.S. Sanitary Commission, which was a large women's organization in the North that supplied the Union troops, uh, not only with quilts, but with many other supplies. And the third group that's doing this is called Operation Homefront Quilts, uh, founded by a 19-year-old young lady, and uh, her mother has taken over most of the work now. But they also have volunteers around the nation that supply uh, cloth or tops or completed quilts. And the, each of these quilts in all three projects have these memorial labels. Um, they are in, they use symbols of national national symbols that um, speak of the national ideals that these quilts are um, uh, trading upon, borrowing, to send a message of comfort and a value of a life given. Um, that's the end of my prepared remarks. Um, I do appreciate your attentiveness and waiting for the quilts to get there. <laughs> And I would, uh, before I take questions, if there are any, I wanted to mention that uh, at the International Quilt Study Center and Museum, uh, just across town at 33rd and Holdridge, we are opening an exhibition called Chintz Applique from Imitation to Icon, and that begins on Saturday. And some of the quilts that, are, that were in this presentation, you will be able to go look at in person and read those great little poems and sentiments. So thank you, and I'll, I'll take your questions. Yes? The quilt, the first of the Iraq um, memory quilts, or memory quilts that you showed us, um, it looks like it has a lot of written text in some of the blocks. What kinds of things do they say, since they're prepared mm -hmm. by people who didn't know the person or didn't know who was going to be received? Um, you're right, there are inscriptions on each block. Always are included is the name and the city of the person who's inscribed the block. Uh, some include scripture verses, some include just a personal sentiment of, I will not forget, we will not forget, thank you for your sacrifice. Um, some are, are lengthy, but most are very brief. Yes? Have you or others been involved with any projects, like current projects with children, perhaps, making memory quilts or ways? I, I'm thinking of the schoolhouse yeah. quilt project. Um, she's asked if, if I'm aware of or I've been involved in any projects um, where children are making memory quilts. Uh, there's, um, I was involved a couple of years ago with um, a project that the Robert Hillisted Textiles Gallery at, in the Department of Textiles, Clothing, and Design did with children from Clinton Elementary School here in Lincoln. And they were making story quilts. So they came and learned something about quilts and began to develop their ideas and then they uh, made these quilts that told stories of their lives or their school. Um, 
and a number of those quilts have been on exhibition at the Hillston Gallery recently. One other thing related to children that um, it's not what you're asking, but uh, related to the Iraq War, there are a number, there's a, a group that is making uh, snuggle quilts, they call them, for children whose parent ha or parents have been deployed to Afghanistan or Iraq. And these quilts um, have photographs of the parent transferred onto cloth and then incorporated into the quilt so that the child can snuggle with dad or mom um, and the, the testimonies that come back from the, the guardian of the child is, speaks of how the child will grab that quilt and wrap up with daddy or mommy or, or cry holding their quilt remembering that, um, how much they miss their parent. Uh, the question is, when were quilts first created? Uh, the easy answer is, I don't know. <laughs> um, quilt making traditions um, in, in Europe go back hundreds of years, and it's, uh, there are quilt making traditions today all over the world, and um, in most every continent. Um, how far back those traditions go in each of those cultures, we're not totally sure. But um, I would feel comfortable saying it's probably thousands of years, more than hundreds. And it wasn't invented in the U.S. <laughs> well, I thank you so much for your attention. Have a good day.